A few years ago, Dark Souls reached its 10th anniversary. And even after all this time, there is still a particular spell that I just don't ever see in, well, anything. And that spell is Gravelord Sword Dance. This made me wonder, what is it about this spell, or spells, that has made it fall into obscurity? I rarely see it used outside of the odd PvP compilation, let alone in some sort of challenge run. This begs the question, is there a reason this spell never gets the spotlight in challenge runs? Well, there are quite a few reasons, actually. Where do I start with this one? Okay, so first of all, you only get two casts per Gravelord spell, so that's already a bit of a downside. And there's only two Gravelord spells in the whole game, so that means you only get four casts. The spells themselves aren't exactly easy to obtain, either. If you want to get them straight away, you have to run all the way through the catacombs to join the Gravelord Servant's Covenant. But at the same time, being able to access them before killing any bosses outside of Asylum Demon is actually one good thing about choosing these spells for a challenge run. But still, that's only one spell you're getting. Hypothetically, you could get the second spell by running to the Great Hollow to farm the Basilisks for Eyes of Death. Yeah, that's another thing. If you're offline, the only way to get the Covenant items is to farm the most notoriously obnoxious enemy in the series. Okay, so maybe getting the spells is a bit of a hassle, but surely this is for balancing purposes, right? The spells themselves must be ridiculously overpowered. I'll admit, in some cases, yes, they can be very overpowered. But it takes some discipline to learn to spot openings for the 5 second cast time. Yes, this spell takes about 5 seconds to cast. That means by the time you are done, most bosses will have already recovered, and will be ready to punish you. Sounds like fun! To add to my list of grievances, what is perhaps the most infamous flaw with Gravelord Miracles are the inconsistent, RNG-based hitboxes. Never before have I seen a spell that can't hit enemies at point blank. But it's even worse than just that. Sometimes you can actually see the spell piercing the enemy, going through it, and it still won't count as a hit. Was that everything on the list? Eh, probably not. But it's time to stop complaining and get myself together, because we're gonna try to beat Dark Souls with only Gravelord Miracles. For this run, we're gonna start as a Pyromancer, and pick the master key for our gift. The reason being, in order for this run to work, we have to get a pyromancy flame as soon as possible. While the only rule in the challenge is to use Gravelord Miracles to beat everything, it isn't actually possible to do it without a little help. So buffs, such as Power Within, are allowed. I had a few failed versions of this run where I tried to start as a cleric with fire bombs, so I could use the glitch to beat Asylum Demon with Gravelord Miracles, but it turns out I couldn't even do enough damage to Asylum Demon, and we can't afford to sacrifice the Master Key or the Pyromancy Flame. I guess you could still do the glitch if you want to fight this guy with your broken sword, but I figured we'd get to fight two more of them, so it wasn't really worth it. So after getting everything we need from Oscar, we can fight the Asylum Demon with our Pyromancer gear, abandoning it all at Firelink Shrine, where our challenge officially begins. I spend some time getting every soul item I can access, as well as punching and kicking the hollows off the cliff, so I have enough souls to buy the Thoralind Talisman from Petrus, which is the strongest one we can get for early game. While doing that, of course I also get the Red Tear Stone Ring, which is a crucial tool for this run. After this, I head to the Catacombs to get some Eyes of Death, and claim our first spell for the run. I knock Hollows off the cliff until I can reach the faith requirement for the talisman, and with this, we can finally try out our spell. But before we can even do that, I have to get power within if we're gonna stand a chance against the first boss. So down to Blight Town it is. This is where our perfectly planned starter class setup comes in handy. That was annoying, but we're finally here in Undead Burg and are officially strong enough to challenge the first boss of this run. Unfortunately, I can't get rid of these archers, 
so we'll have to see if the Taurus demon will do the job for us. If these archers were gone, the jump would be a perfect opening for our first hit. But if he doesn't manage to kill them, it can get pretty hectic up here. My strategy for this fight is to keep both archers close to the ledge he jumps on, letting them shoot me down into RTSR range right before he jumps up to maximize our damage. For the second hit, RTSR shouldn't be necessary, but we still have to be really careful because of how punishable the cast is. And of course, he jumps out of it. It takes a bit of practice to get this timing down, but when you finally do it, it really feels like you're beating it for the very first time. The levels for this run are going to be spent almost exclusively on faith and vitality, because unfortunately decks won't help us. In Dark Souls 1, getting dexterity to at least 35 will increase the casting speed for a select few offensive spells, and, you guessed it, Gravelord Sword Dance isn't one of them. I have a little fun testing out the spell on these hollows here, and go through the motions of getting the Paris shortcut. I make quick work of the channeler blocking our way, and come back to see how our damage looks against the gargoyles. If I can actually get a word in edgewise. So if you watched my last video, you'll know that I had a theory about this spell and the gargoyles. Basically, I thought that you could kill them with only one Gravelord Miracle, as long as you time it perfectly with the second hit, so that it hits both of them. I didn't end up doing that in my previous playthrough, but this run is different. I have two things that I didn't have then, which are RTSR and Power Within, so I figured it was worth another shot. So here I was, two hours in, losing my mind trying to get this timing down, when I see it. My window of opportunity. I have been waiting for this exact setup forever, where they are both spitting fire right next to each other. I can't miss this chance, so even without RTSR, I go for it. It works. This was probably the most satisfying kill I've ever gotten in Dark Souls. With these souls, I continue leveling health, but also level attunement until we have three slots since that's all we'll need for the whole playthrough. After this, I speed through Lower Undead Berg, leveling up one more time before challenging the Capra Demon. The first attempt wasn't going so well. The dogs like to watch and wait until I use my buff, and then attack, just to make my life worse. And I end up missing the spell anyway, before inevitably dying. For the second attempt, I used common sense and buffed before coming in. But I could already tell I was in for the long haul. I was fully prepared to be here suffering for three hours. In an extreme case of good luck, I got a frame-perfect RTSR cast that took out the Capra Demon half a second before my health ran out from power within. This is probably the only time in the playthrough where I can say I died happy. I go back to retrieve the souls and immediately head into the depths. This area is very important if we want to progress in the playthrough. With my two casts of Sword Dance, it takes a long time to farm these basilisks for another miracle. The rats loved to interfere with my farming attempts as well. I learned that quitting out is actually mandatory in this playthrough. I get a fat bag of souls from the farming session, and stop health at 30 for now so we can focus on faith. Now that the gang's all here in Firelink, I have to get my talisman before it's too late. While it will be a while until our Thoroland talisman is outclassed, it's best if we get it as soon as possible, in case of an emergency. So we're gonna have to do something that Patches would surely be proud of, and exterminate these cleric pests.
Not even gonna look me in the eye, huh? Well, here you go, Nito. Might as well get this, too. Now that I'm decked out with both Gravelord Miracles, what better way to try them out than on Quelog? The damage is... actually looking a little rough. I'm buffed with Power Within, but all four casts aren't even close to finishing her off. When I hit Quelog with RTSR active, I myself am hit with a brutal truth. I can't kill her unless I manage to pull off all four RTSR Power Within hits. Initially, I wasn't too worried about this, since she has a pretty simple and slow moveset, but trust me, this is not nearly as easy as it sounds. Waiting for openings actually takes a really long time, and time is of the essence here. I can't afford to miss even a single hit with Power Within still going. Usually, what would happen is I would take too long to hit her, or I would go too fast and die from the health drain. She also is way better at punishing than you'd think, even though she isn't a particularly fast boss. Here's an example of the power within wearing off just before the last hit. It's depressing when this happens, but it was going to be close anyway, even with power within. After going at it for almost three hours, I take a break and set my sights on a new target. This spell may not be the best, but it's pretty fun to kill regular enemies with. The Black Knight is out of the way, and I have a clear path to the Hydra. My damage is actually pretty good, but that doesn't mean anything with how hard it is to land four hits. Imagine you're using an RNG spell that hits its target when it feels like it, against an enemy that also has a janky hurt box. Said enemy also decides to hit you when it feels like it, even if you stand in the same spot where it missed you three times in a row. You also have to use RTSR and Power Within at the same time to kill it, but you gotta be fast so your buff doesn't wear off. But you also have to time your hits perfectly and pray that it doesn't kill you while you're casting. And if you do manage to land a hit, you have to find a new spot for the next one. And you have to do that four times within 100 seconds. But don't forget, each cast also takes five seconds. Good luck! I got sick of this and went to Moonlight Butterfly instead. Finally, something that goes right for a change. With the much needed souls, I keep leveling Faith. We'll need around 40 to do more damage. After this, I go back to the catacombs to get another chore out of the way. Pinwheel has such low health that, at least, I don't need all my buffs for this. Yeah, I don't have any doubts about my damage in this case. But jeez, does this guy like to evade every hit. Pinwheel flies around so much that it actually takes a few tries before I can kill him. Come here, Pinwheel. There's no use in prolonging the inevitable. Now we have an early Rite of Kindling and the Mask of the Father. That's pretty cool. We can even get more faith as well. I stick around in the Tomb of the Giants to see if I can get the Sanctus, but turns out Leroy doesn't spawn unless you have the Lord Vessel. You learn something new every day. Well, okay then. I guess there's still a good reason to be here. We can get the Silver Serpent Ring and some more Eyes of Death. I kill the Havel Warrior out of boredom and make my way to... The Great Hollow? Desperate times call for desperate measures. I don't even care how long it takes. I'm gonna farm these guys until I get 20 Eyes of Death for that extra damage boost. At least down here there's no rats to interrupt me, and with the extra souls they drop, I can simultaneously work towards my goal of 40 faith. After I get a 20% boost to my Gravelord Miracles, I try Quaylog again. The extra damage is pretty significant, but I still just can't do it in time before Power Within runs out. I try the Hydra again for a few more hours and get painfully close to victory, but five hours of that was just too much for me. I give up and start farming at the Drake Bridge, but I soon realize it will be another five hours before I get enough souls. So I might as well just cut to the chase with duplication if I'm gonna farm anyway. We get a little more than 40 from that, but in any case, 
I'm just happy to finally be able to progress. I was a little worried that the playthrough would be dead at this point, but now that we finally have a stronger talisman, it's actually possible to kill Quaylog without all the extra buffs. There's also way less pressure, when I can heal as much as I want without worrying about staying in RTSR range. I hit her right before she finishes her AoE animation, so that was a pretty cool kill. Finally, my labor has borne fruit and the run can continue. I'm feeling a little confident, so I head down to Ceaseless Discharge. At least this time I actually do the cheese correctly. So here's hit one, then hit two, uh, are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Alright, fine, run invalidated I guess. Well, we're not missing much with that guy anyway. And all those levels into faith are working wonders for our miracle damage. Logically, our next course of action is to head into Sin's Fortress, which thankfully I breezed through this time around. I do die a few times to this giant during casting, but after applying power within, he doesn't really stand a chance. The Iron Golem has less health than Quaylog, oddly enough, so damage won't be a problem with this one. Landing the spell, though? Yeah, that was a minor inconvenience and cost me a few attempts. There also were times where I wasn't paying attention to the health drain and kinda just died. But the good news is, if we're careful, we have time to clear off most of its health bar before dying to power within, after which we can heal and still do enough damage to finish the fight. After this, I level up some in Anne Orlando and rush through the area to get every bonfire I can. And a single level, before doing a 180 back to Darkroot. At nearly 50 faith, there's just no way we can't finish this at full health. Our damage with Greatsword Dance is a thousand a pop, just with Power Within, so all the stress of perfect timing is taken away. After trying this for five hours, I was just happy to finally have this done. Plus, the Dust Crown Ring is mandatory if we want to progress any further. Next, I take out the Golden Golem to free Dusk and come back for her crown. With these things, the run should really start to pick up from here. I decide to take out the Stray Demon before returning to An Orlando. The damage is very promising, but I do miss a lot, and this fight also takes a few tries to perfect. On my winning attempt, I had ditched RTSR for the Dust Crown Ring instead. I figured extra casts would compensate for the loss of damage. Stray Demon is one of the few bosses in the game with multiple openings that are generous enough for me to safely pull off a cast. So this fight was done pretty quickly. And I can grab the Peculiar Doll, get another level, and make my way back to- wait, how did I end up down here? In case you noticed that I neglected Gaping Dragon earlier, it's because of the large health pool. I knew that if I couldn't do enough damage to Quaylog, I couldn't kill this thing either. So I just put it off until I was sure I was capable of doing decent damage. Now that I'm pretty powerful, Gaping Dragon should be really simple. I'll admit, I died to this several times, and even here, you can see that this thing kinda knocks me around like a ragdoll. I got lucky here when it decided to do the vomit attack, and that was enough for two casts. And with that, the gaping dragon goes down. I don't really know what to level, so I'll get some more endurance. 
Well, the cleanup is out of the way, and with our new tools, we're ready to challenge Ornstein and Smo. I wasn't entirely sure how to go about this fight yet, but I did get a good hit on Ornstein pretty quickly. After a bit of running in circles, I got another hit, and that got me right into phase two. I didn't really know what I was doing here, so I took some pretty dumb risks in this fight. It was only pure luck that my character ducked under that hammer. This slam here actually isn't a bad opportunity to go for a hit, especially with the stagger you get from it. But unfortunately, this just wasn't meant to be, because Smo just hops away from this shot. And on my next hit, I casted way too late and threw the fight. Getting that close was certainly depressing, but it at least gave me the hope to pull through an hour and a half of more attempts. And eventually, I was able to pull off another lucky try like that one. I got very lucky that Ornstein dodged into the spell to end phase one, which as you can see was very risky as I almost died from that greed. For phase two, it was just a bit more of the usual running around in circles to bait the slam or the jump, which I found were the safest moves to punish. This shot though was pure luck. I probably shouldn't have tried to attack here. But hey, it worked out in this case. For the final hit, I was a little late to punish the slam, but I landed it just in the nick of time. Kind of like what happened with Quaylog. And that's one difficult fight of the run over with. With the souls, I level up my endurance more and spend the rest on the Crest of Artorius and other goods from Andre's shop. While we're on this side of town, why not see how we do against Sif? This actually didn't go so well at first. Sif loves to dodge and jump around like crazy, and I think I only managed to land a single hit before getting killed. It took me only three tries to get this one done, because despite missing a few casts, our damage was so high in this case that it hardly mattered at a certain point. Like here, I got three hits, one after another, when Sif hardly moved. It just goes to show how much luck is involved in a run like this. After leveling up, we have a lot of work to do back in Anor Orlando. The first thing we'll do is go to the Painted World for a few shenanigans there. Once at the shortcut door, the kind inhabitants greet me in the local Ariamis fashion, as usual. And we'll deal with a few more of them before trying the area boss. For Priscilla, I didn't buff up, just in case. Since her health is so low, I don't want to one-shot her by some chance and get softlocked. And I think I made a good choice, because even without Power Within, she's at, what, 60% health? After she's been hit once, of course we're safe to buff as much as we want. So I proceed to add Insult to Injury with Power Within, and this fight is literally over in 30 seconds. But that's just the tip of the iceberg of our shenanigans. Damage is really important the further we get in this run. So I popped 10 Humanities in hopes of getting a little souvenir to bring back home, if you know what I mean. Thank God for duplication. Did you know it took me over 30 minutes to get a single souvenir of reprisal with 10 Humanities? It brings me back to the dark days of actually farming for 80 of these. I do some leveling and go back to Firelink Shrine to dupe these with Frampt. Since this will reset our Gravelord Covenant progress, I dupe those too. Ten of those is enough to do a temporary betrayal for the best talisman in the game. And with all these eyes of death, Nito happily takes us back, and we now are max rank in the Gravelord Covenant. 
which gives us a 30% boost to our Gravelord Miracles. Now, I have the audacity to attack Gwendolyn with the Dark Moon Talisman. If you happened to catch my last video, you already know how the first attempt went. Don't worry, I was better about dodging the flurries this time, so you don't have to sit through a painful montage for this playthrough. I even took it upon myself to race to the end of the hallway where I died to the flurries anyway. I don't go for another stunt like that again. I just try to fight normally. And through that, I learned that Gwendolyn's hurtbox lasts quite a long time after teleporting. A few attempts later, even without most of my buffs, Gwendolyn goes down in almost two hits. I also forgot to mention this earlier, but I was using the Ring of the Sun's Firstborn that I picked up, which gives another 20% boost to our miracle damage. Firekeeper isn't happy about us murdering the leader of her religion, but come on, that's just embarrassing. I feel ashamed on Gwendolyn's behalf. The closest boss in this area is Seath, so we make our way to the Duke's archives to challenge him. This fight didn't go very well at all. The damage wasn't really as high as I wanted it to be, and four casts of the miracle weren't enough to do the job. The Dust Crown Ring is mandatory for this fight, but somehow the spell struggles to hit him in the most opportune places. I try other angles and am instantly flattened. So after a few hours of that, I take a break and try to clear Lost Izalith instead. The Demon Fire Sage takes a little longer than I thought it would, and I die quite a few times to the opening attack. That aside, all the other attacks are more or less easy to dodge, and as long as you don't get caught during the cast animation, this fight shouldn't be much of a problem. The explosions are a great opening, and I was able to bait him to do a lot of those in quick succession. For the final hit, I plant a tactical sword under his butt and get a very graceful double KO out of it. We can proceed down the hall for our next challenger, the Centipede Demon. This guy was making me kinda nervous in light of the last video, and a lot of things can go wrong during a 4 second cast. With no guarantee of getting the charred ring during the fight, I have no choice but to stay at the fog gate to try to focus the swords into a smaller space. This is one of the fights where tanking was actually the best strategy, because one hit with RTSR is almost enough to kill it. One more hit, and it just jumps into it. That was easier than expected. Running through Lost Izalith isn't too hard, we can get the shortcut, and get the Bed of Chaos out of the way. At least our number of casts won't be an issue in this fight. We only need three, or two if you happen to roll into this orb like I did. The rest is simple enough. You can come back for the other side, and come back again to exterminate the Chaos Bug. That's a lot of souls that I probably don't need. An increase of one to our Talisman's magic adjustment? Worth it. Putting off Seath for a little longer, I warp to Ulaseel for a fight with the Sanctuary Guardian. This one is always a little sloppy, but we'll get through it. It takes a little while to cast without getting interrupted, and my first successful cast misses, which is kinda annoying. When I get another cast, I realize just how much of a joke this fight is, and my apprehension is gone just like that. Dodging to the right during the slam and immediately following up with a cast is a good strategy for this one. And if you're buffed up, you can wrap this up in two hits. For the rest of the playthrough, I'm only going to be leveling Faith in hopes of reaching max damage. Because while it isn't much, even the most microscopic increase could be just enough to finish off a boss. Now it's time for the fight we've all been waiting for. A true test to show everything we've learned so far. The Leap is the best opening you'll ever get in this fight, but if he recovers before you finish your cast, prepare to be instantly annihilated. Artorius might as well be a tailor-made counter to our build, 
Sometimes the dodges are so perfect, it feels like a choreographed fight. That was so beautiful. I don't even care if I die. He deserves the win for that alone. If you time this right, he'll go straight into the buff after the first hit. This is what we want. You can either follow up with another cast, or reposition yourself to set up another leap if you want full damage. Every now and then, he'll dodge into it, which gives a huge damage boost. Here, I got really lucky, as he also went into his buff. But there's another thing. If you're not fast enough, the health drain will get you. So good luck, I guess. This kept happening to me. So I looked around online and found a solution. Turns out there's yet another thing I never knew about in this game called Super Hyper Mode. Basically, you let yourself get cursed, stack it with the Dust Crown Ring, and your HP will be low enough that Power Within is too slow to kill you. You also need to have the Sanctus equipped, which I happen to have already. One more thing. If you plan to do this, don't level your health. I have too much health to be in true super hyper mode. So we're just gonna use this scuffed one and hope I still have enough time to do this before I die. There's nothing to do but try it. We gotta be quick for Artorius anyway. So we'll see how it holds up in that small amount of time. Here, I actually misjudged what he was doing. See how he dodged back like that? I thought he was going for another buff. Turns out he came right back, barreling towards me with a flip, which gave me perhaps the luckiest counter hit of my life. Okay, he's a good guy and all. He probably didn't deserve that disrespect. But I just couldn't help myself. I've picked up all the bonfires in the DLC, so I go ahead and let Goff take care of Calamite, so he'll be ready to fight when we get back. For now, I'm gonna give the DLC a break and force myself to try Seath again. The super hyper mode should help a lot in this fight, and it also takes away the fear of being cursed. With hours upon hours of trial and error, I found a consistent strategy. In order to guarantee an opening, you have to let Seath mosey on over before you break the crystal. Do that, and he'll do his telegraphed roar, and you should be close enough to cast before he starts to attack. His little crystal spray that he does starts on the left. So next, you can attack on the right, and as long as you keep an eye on what he's doing, you should be fine, and be able to get out of there if he chooses to do his AoE. I was on the verge of death and had to heal, but I made a dumb mistake casting this without RTSR. At this point, I was being more careful. I really, really wanted to be done with this fight. I even took off my shield to get back into RTSR range faster. I screwed up again and didn't time this one right. RTSR actually activated right as Power Within ran out, but thankfully it was still enough to finish him off. If I had to choose, this was a contender for the least fun fight of the playthrough. It was just a slog to get through. After my faith hits the 65 threshold, our talisman has a 230 attack rating. One more point for our Gravelord Miracles. Speaking of Gravelord Miracles, isn't there something I'm forgetting? That's right! I haven't even touched the Tomb of the Giants in ages. Shouldn't we be ready to take on Nito himself? Being in hyper mode was actually detrimental in this fight. I could hardly ever reach Nito before getting one-shotted by the skeletons. So let's try ditching it altogether. Nito has less health than Seath, so we should be good to go this time around. Unlike some of the other bosses we faced, Nito is a perfect target for Gravelord Sword Dance, ironically. He's so slow that we can get one or two casts at a time. 
and at full health, we can tank the hits from the Skelly Squad. From here, this plays out like any other Nito fight. We let him take care of the skeletons for a bit, and go back in for another hit. Luckily, he's pretty weak to magic damage, so this fight can easily be done in under a minute. Only two base game bosses remain. The next one I've been putting off forever. And you can see why. It certainly is fun trying to get through the ghost room without a melee weapon. We're following the dress code, so we're awarded the key to the seal. And we now have access to a boss that, being completely honest with you, I was 99% sure was impossible to defeat within the rules of the challenge. For a test run, I start my first attempt with Power Within and no RTSR, just to kinda see what damage is looking like. Keep in mind that we can only have one ring for this fight, and I chose the Dust Crown ring for the extra casts. Our strongest miracle does a little over 3,000 damage, which actually exceeded my expectations. I wait for the second king to spawn in to see how the weak one does. It still isn't that bad. Three hits of our weaker spell does about 2,500 so we can do roughly 6,000 damage on the four kings with power within alone. Impressive for sure, but not impressive enough. The health bar for the four kings is over 9,000, so I still don't think this is possible under any normal circumstances. That being said, I think it's best to sleep on the Four Kings for now and go back to the DLC. Calamite has low enough health to beat, there's no doubt about that, but beating him proved to be a real challenge. This by far took way longer than Artorius. At around 8 hours of attempts, I had almost given up. The natural pace of this fight is a lot slower than Artorius, and my scuffed hyper mode might not carry me through this like it did with that one. I set a personal sweet spot of health to maximize the time I have before using Power Within. And since my game cheated me out of the symbol of Avarice, I had to run up and down the stairs and fall down the cliff over and over to get myself into RTSR range. So what of the fight itself? There's plenty of openings, but you have to bait them in time and also be good at predicting his next move. Some of his startup animations look really similar. I learned this lesson the hard way. Ideally, you'll get a situation like this one, where he spams fire breath over and over. That is your best chance to attack. With super scuffed mode active, I had a make or break decision to make here. This was the luckiest moveset I had ever gotten. So I just took the shot and was able to finish moments before death. This was the most liberating moment of the whole playthrough. Make no mistake, Calamite. There's no good sportsmanship between us. If I weren't dead, I would have pointed down on you too. I actually leveled Endurance this time? That's different. After taking down the rest of the DLC bosses, I was eager and nervous to try my hand at Manus. He is the tankiest boss in the game if you don't count the Four Kings, and I'm not even sure I can do enough damage to beat him. Oh yeah, and he's also as fast, if not faster, than Artorius. So this should be fun. 
It's bad enough that it takes me an hour to even land a hit on him, but when I do, he reacts instantly before I even have a chance to move. Because damage isn't looking so good, I decide to do a little test. By now, you already know my philosophy. I'll do any exploit that prevents a few hours of farming in times of desperation. The duplicated souls allow me to quickly reach max faith, which is when our talisman gets its final boost to miracles. A grand total of... 10 extra points. I also level strength and dex to very specific values, for a reason you'll know in a moment. Now let's flush away those extra souls, and see how much our damage has increased. The Four Kings is merely for demonstration. At this point, I am positive that it's impossible to do this without cheating or breaking the rules. As you can see, even at max faith, with as much damage as possible, you just can't do it. This run lives on buff stacking, and when we have to sacrifice a ring slot for a boss like this, it kind of falls apart. If there were a glitch to go in without the Covenant of Artorias, with both the Dust Crown Ring and RTSR for Hyper Mode, I think it would be doable. But as far as I know, nothing like that exists, so I just have to face the reality and admit defeat on this one. You also can wrong warp to Gwen to avoid the fight which technically isn't breaking the rules. But I didn't have access to the Force Miracle, and completely forgot about the Purple Coward's Crystal method. If you think about it, maybe it's possible if you let multiple kings spawn in and get them all in the same hit, but come on, with this RNG spell? I might as well be trying to win the lottery. If anyone watching knows something that I don't that would make the Four Kings possible, please let me know. I just want to see if someone could pull this off without cheating out of curiosity. What I ended up doing was pretty lame, actually. I expended all the miracles I could and switched to an unupgraded Gravelord sword, which seemed like the next best thing I could use. And yeah, I just kind of felt like a loser the whole time. At max faith, we actually can do enough damage to Manus to kill him. But Manus himself is absolutely horrifying in the context of this challenge. There is just so much to unpack with my experience attempting this. The first thing about this fight is that it felt completely random. His choice of moves, his opening move, his punishes, everything just felt so random. What was most frustrating about this fight is that it felt like nothing was ever in my control. There was no way for me to bait what I wanted him to do, and there were virtually no guaranteed openings. The most consistent method I found was the extended hand slam. If timed correctly, you can get a cast while he is still performing the attack, and if all goes well, you should have time to dodge his next attack. Another good thing about that is that he tends to jump away, which is both good and bad. It's good because it gives you time to recover from the attack animation, but bad because there's a pretty good chance he just won't get hit at all. But even then, it's the best possible reaction you can get, because it's the only way that his slam is punishable. The only other opening I could find in Phase 1 is the Wombo Combo, but that one is really risky, both in terms of baiting and in terms of punishing. You have to have perfect spacing to hit him without getting killed. Despite how grim all that sounds, the most frustrating part is that this fight is actually possible to beat. Within my 14 hours of attempting this, I managed to get painfully close to victory. I got a once-in-a-lifetime fight with perfect RNG, but choked around the end. I'm not sure if there was any chance of saving this. Maybe I could have dodged a split second earlier, but my luck kinda ran out when he chose the wombo combo. Basically, after that, I gave myself a week to beat this, since this was supposed to be a Halloween special and because I have real life obligations. And I hate to say it, but I wasn't able to do it. It definitely sucks to say that you gave up at something in a challenge run, but this fight was something that could take potential weeks to complete. 
So as much as I wanted to beat this, I just had to move on. If I ever try this again, it will be at the very least with the proper hyper mode setup. If any of you hate yourselves enough to attempt this, feel free to send me a mention if you upload a video of yourself beating this in my stead. As for Gwen, this fight was free compared to the DLC boss marathon. Provided you are actually decent at the game, you can parry him for a free opening, a luxury you don't have with most bosses. If you suck at parrying like a certain someone, the grab is your go-to opening. If you do parry him, be careful, because the spell might just go right through him, so it might be better to back up or strafe around him so it connects. Don't ask me though, I didn't parry him a single time in my winning attempt. I just casted during his opening attack. He loves to hop around and give you huge stagger damage. Luckily, he goes for a grab. I missed my cast here, but I was so stubborn that I just threw out another one and somehow it worked. And you want to guess what move this genius tried next? I may be bad at this game, but so is Gwen, so all things balanced out in the end. Looks like it's Halloween night in Lordran. Forever. So, is it possible to beat Dark Souls with only Gravelord Miracles? Not really. But you can beat every boss besides the Four Kings, and you can use a skip for the Four Kings to avoid breaking the rules. Not every challenge is possible to complete, that's just how it is. But that doesn't mean it isn't worth it to try, just to see how far you can get. And sometimes, you can get pretty far. As always, thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed this Dark Souls challenge. Normally, I'd say you should try it yourself, but this was a pretty scary one. I wouldn't wish such horror on anyone. So have a good Halloween, and look forward to even more challenge videos in the future.